people of India have uh, had a long tradition of uh, education, higher learning, and the, the, some of the oldest universities that we know were uh, the, uh, the, the universities as Takshila and Nalanda in the uh, uh, western part of uh, India, which is now in uh, Pakistan, Takshila, and uh, uh, Nalanda, which is in the eastern part. Takshila was before Christ, uh, 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 but when the Nalanda uh, uh, University was one of the largest in the world at that time, from somewhere around uh, 5th AD to 12th AD, it continued, and it, it attracted scholars from all over the world to learn, and, and the university pattern here was the students and teachers of all disciplines will stay in big uh, campus. It was a typical modern residential university kind of a system. And it, it imparted knowledge in various disciplines. But then with, when the Mughals invaded the uh, 11th century, destroyed the university completely. After that, for about till the uh, British came, there was no formal education system in India. The, the education was then confined to individualized learning by a student with a, with a teacher called, uh, and, and that's typical guru, that one would stay with the teacher, learn from uh, that teacher everything that one wanted to learn. When, 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 the, when the British started the, their own way of education, which was essentially to produce clerical staff, it was realized by some people in, in, in the country that that's not the education that will really serve the purpose. And two initiatives were made. One was by the great industrialist Tata, who set up uh, the Indian Institute of Science uh, at Bangalore in the 1890s, and which even uh, today is called as Tata Institute. Locally, it's most common known. The other major initiative was done by a remarkable person, Madan Mohan Malviya, who was a trained lawyer, who became a politician and then became a social reformer. And he planned in 1905 to set up the Banaras Hindu University with very clear intention that this university will be very different from the British University that were being set up. This will be a, a kind of synthesis, confluence of the best of the Indian or Hindu philosophy and the modern science and technology, where within one campus, all disciplines will be discussed in a common manner. And it was also decided that no money from the British will be taken for this. This was to be entirely by participation of public across the country Maharajas and uh, princes and uh, uh, Jamindars, uh, big industrial houses, and even a poor beggar on the street contributed to Banas Hindu University, which is now today set up in about 1300 acres of land, beautifully planned, about 140 departments today. You name a subject, you name a language, you name uh, a discipline, and it's taught there. And this is what was set up there. And uh, the way it was run and uh, practice, it very quickly became one of the best universities in the, uh, in the country. P uh, students from all over the country would want if they can study at BHU. And BHU has produced great scientists, great philosophers who have actually been involved both in administration and science development and in philosophy across the uh, country. And, uh, and of course, many of them have been abroad as well. And even today, BHU remains one of the best universities in the country. But what has happened after independence is that uh, although we expanded our education system enormously and it went on fairly well till 1970 on that the education was being given due importance although money was limited but still the quality of teachers continued to provide best uh, what, whatever they could be doing but from 1970 onwards there has been a, a shift more and more money more emphasis goes to research institutes and universities and colleges didn't get the amount of support, both financial as well as moral, that they deserve. And in the process, with increasing population, with increasing number of colleges being opened, and it becoming more of a kind of commercial activity than a real educational social activity, the quality of teaching, quality of learning had declined and has continued to decline till date very seriously. The, the result today is that although we have nearly about 300 universities and uh, several, several thousand colleges. The number is still too small for the last population. But even these, the, the teaching quality in science is really very poor. Most students never learn or never have the, uh, the uh, practice uh, or opportunity of doing laboratory work by their own hands. They just see some demonstration or they just read about it. And uh, the, the learning is more of uh, 
not really getting excited about science, getting excited about biology. It's just some information is given to them and they take it and that's it. And, and consequently, quality of research is going down in the country and this has resulted in a serious introspection in, in recent years. In, in the uh, educationists, the government itself, uh, politicians fortunately are also becoming conscious that we are at a very serious uh, situation now. And if country really wants to be a leading economy, knowledge economy, it must improve its science education and overall education. And consequently, in the last 10 years, the science academies, the, the bureaucrats, the, the other scientists have come together to think about what can be done. And some new major initiatives that have happened is, like one is a major program called INSPIRE, which aims to handle millions of school children across the country. From every school, at least one child will be involved uh, to be rewarded in some ways for doing something in science. Then when the, school, when the students come to secondary and college level, well, there, there, there'll be some filtration, but then those who have been doing well in science will continue to get scholarship. And this will continue after, for PhD and beyond PhD, uh, there will be about 1,000 people every year inducted as tenure track faculty if they've been doing well with good support. So, so that is something uh, th that we expect that will attract better people, uh, better uh, faculty to uh, teaching uh, and to do research. In addition, now that we are preparing for the 12 plan and there have been major discussions about this, the, the, the 12 five year plan, uh, you know, we, we plan for five years at one time, that okay, next five years, what kind of priorities we should give. And there it has been decided that the government will invest in education at a scale which has never happened in Indian history before. And the idea is that every college in the university, besides opening many, many new universities and colleges, the existing ones will be really revamped. They will be given one-time grant to improve their infrastructure and to increase research by most university teachers and college teachers. A system is being planned that let's give them soft grants. Not that they have to compete with more established scientists because then they always run out and they withdraw. They just give them some money to start up to ask a question which they may, which they may not have done anything, but just do something. And with that happening, the course is being uh, uh, reviewed very, and there is now a clear mandate that the teaching has to be much more broad based. A student of biology must learn physics and a student of physics must learn biology at school and uh, uh, undergraduate level at least. And plus uh, their kind of menu based uh, semester system is being practiced. At the same time, what has happened, the, the other side where biology particularly is concerned, we have had a something which was remarkably done in 1980 that we started giving courses in biotechnology which I don't think, I personally think was not the right thing, but then this became a fashion and every undergraduate student would want, who wants to study biology would study biotechnology instead of biology. And these students have not really, uh, although they expected that they will get very good jobs like what people have been getting in information technology, that biotechnology will be the buzzword and they will get, but nothing of the kind has happened. In the process, their training is very poor. Having realized this, Department of Biotechnology of Government of India, which has been actually spearheading biotechnology teaching, has now realized and now is supporting uh, actually School of Life Sciences. It's funding in a major way those university departments have done something good to improve their overall biology, to bring uh, together the, the, the different departments. Likewise, it is also funding colleges. Uh, it wants to increase more and more colleges. Uh, to get, get better integrated teaching. And I think with that, uh, with that kind of situation, one can be hopeful. And the important point uh, to uh, realize this hope will be, if the young people who join the faculty now do not remain confined to their narrow disciplines. They must uh, make use of the biodiversity, the, the, the enormous uh, material that is available untouched for research. Only when they start doing, going beyond the model system, going beyond what they had done, in their postdoc or PhD work, they start up new things. And because the advantage here is we will have grants which do not require that what you have contributed already in this field. You can just start on a completely new field. And thereby, if this is uh, really uh, taken advantage of, I think biology will have a tremendous uh, future in India and one can really enjoy the, the biology in its full glory uh, if you look at the biological system as a whole.